Go ahead, Greg, you're on. All right. Um, can I get screen sharing so I can share my screen? Should be good to go. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see that now. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Craig Wilson. I'm with the I'm the president of VFP Chapter 100 in Alaska, and this workshop is uh, regarding the Arctic Nuclear Weapons Free Zone. Uh, my little part of this will be providing a, a brief introduction for folks to, so everyone's working off the same page when the other presenters uh, provide uh, their input. They're really the, uh, the experts in this. We'll get started here. Um, first off, get everybody lined up as to where the Arctic is. There's a nice little quote. Um, we tend, if you're in the lower 48, you tend to think of the Arctic as uh, something a little strange. You don't really know where it is. First thing you need to do is change your point of view. Now, this map isn't as bad as a lot of ones you, see, you, you saw when you were growing up, but try to find the Arctic in this map. You know, the Arctic Ocean, is it over on the upper left, the middle? It's, you know, the, the map you use uh, reflects your priorities and your point of view. And the priorities of most of the world are not in the Arctic. If you live up here, this is the way you, you view it. You know, you've got the, the North Pole at the center, and all of a sudden you've actually, see, you can see that you actually have an Arctic Ocean and that um, Russia and US in terms of Alaska are pretty close. As Sarah Palin said, you can, if you're in Alaska, you can see Russia in your backyard. When we define what the Arctic is, there's two general definitions of, so when the other folks are talking about it, one is that blue circle you see, that's 66 degrees north latitude. North of that line, you have at least one day a year where the sun doesn't come up and one day a year where the sun never goes down. A more commonly used definition is that red line. This is what the UN uses. That's where the average summer temperature of the warmest month of the year doesn't go above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But people do live up here. Um, you know, we've got uh, the Arctic covers you know, roughly 40 million square kilometers, um, about 8% of the Earth's surface, and there's about 4 million people who live here. Um, and the native folks that have been living here, the indigenous peoples, have been living here tens of thousands of years, uh, predating uh, colonization of the Americas. Um, Many of the groups, um, the Inuit in particular, have uh, bonded together into uh, various groups. The Inuit Circumpolar Conference, or Circumpolar Council, rather, covers uh, uh, about eight, and they represent about 180,000 Inuit in Alaska, Canada, Greenland, and, and Russia. Um, they hold a status at the UN as a consultant body, and they've come out um, with an Arctic policy. They've they've redone it a number of times, uh, and I'll just notice if you notice this is their latest Arctic policy. Um, says item eight: no nuclear weapons in the Arctic, no nuclear testing, no nuclear disposal, no. Um, you know, transportation of no radioactive mining, they're opposed to all this. And you might go, well, why, you know, how did that happen? And well, there's a lot of history of nuclear weapons in the Arctic. You know, as most folks are probably aware, 
There's been a lot of nuclear testing, um, primarily by the US and Russia. Uh, you know, 2000 some odd nuclear tests um, before the test ban treaty came into effect. And of those, uh, a large number are in Russia, were in the Arctic. Russia in particular, they at Nova, Novaya Zemlya, over 224 nuclear tests, in equivalent to uh, 265 metric million uh, tons of dynamite, including the, uh, the world's largest nuclear weapon that was ever tested, the Sar Bomba, back in uh, 1961. Uh, Basically, this was the um, a one-off uh, trying to make the Russians look good. Uh, it was roughly, to give you the idea, 33,600 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The shock wave from that bomb circled the globe three times. And the flash was seen in Norway, over a thousand kilometers away. Here in Alaska, um, there were three nuclear tests over on a yeah, Amchitka Island um, in the Aleutians, including the Kanakin test, which was uh, the largest met, the largest test in the US. Um, the Department of Energy and the military decided to do it on Amchitka because the bomb was actually too large to safely detonate in Nevada. And uh, as a side note, um, the Amchitka test the, the, was actually the one of the initiating events for what now became Greenpeace. And we've had other things up here. Um, one of the items that uh, is little known is uh, Project Chariot. Um, we'll get a, to that. Um, so there's the Amchika test. The, the Kanakin test was actually, a, you can see the missile on the right. It was part of the uh, Reagan's, uh, or Nixon's uh, anti-ballistic missile defense. The idea was put a nuclear warhead on a missile, send it up to blow up the other incoming ballistic missiles. And they thought it was a good idea to basically aim a missile down a hole with a five megaton warhead and see what happens. Project Chariot was a little stranger. This was um, part of uh, Operation Plowshares. The idea was uh, let's make an artificial harbor in Northwest Alaska by exploding five hydrogen bombs. Uh, we won't really bother telling the folks at Point Hope about it. And um, when they did find out, they stopped it, but not before Department of Energy went and buried radioactive waste from Nevada um, at the site just to see what would happen. Uh, as a result, um, the cleanup of that uh, just finished up a few years ago. Uh, it was uh, kind of buried for the longest period of time. And then there's, Along with deliberate nuclear testing in the Arctic, um, there's been a number of incidents where nuclear arms or uh, radioactivity has been released into the, into the Arctic on purpose or um, not so much on purpose. Uh, Russian Navy has a, a bad habit of either having their nuclear submarines um, explode and sink such as the Kursk or the Cosmolots, or just basically just decommissioning them and sinking them with uh, their nuclear reactors intact off of, of primarily in the Kara Sea. Uh, right now off of Novaya Zemla, there are at least 16 reactors um, just sunk in the ocean. Uh, from 13 submarines and a couple of nuclear icebreakers. The U.S. has also had a few issues. Uh, most uh, 
Notably, uh, a B-52 carrying four hydrogen bombs crashed off of Green Tule, Greenland. Uh, two of those bombs are still at the bottom of the ocean off of Western Greenland. And of course, the Russian Cosmos 954 satellite had a nuclear reactor and uh, entered the atmosphere and broke up over uh, northern Canada spraying radioactive debris. And we all probably remember Chernobyl. So what's happened is all from all those tests is that uh, the, the radioactive fallout and about 12% of it ends up being deposited near the test site and about another 10% ends up in a band circling the earth at about the same latitude as a test. So you can look on the right hand side, you can see that we start getting up around you know, 60, 70 degrees north latitude. There's a fair amount of uh, residual radiation um, left over from those nuclear tests. So, and a, a brief introduction is for those of you who don't know what a nuclear weapons free zone is, this is not something new. Uh, the original concept dates back to the 1950s. Uh, one was proposed for Eastern Europe in, in the area of Poland and U Ukraine. Uh, the Nordic countries uh, proposed one in 1958. Uh, they were actually written into the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, there's an entire process of how you go about uh, setting one up, um, and uh, Adele will talk about that more. Um, and currently, there are 10 nuclear uh, free weapon zones in the U.S. or in the world now. Um, they cover, you know, like it shows in here. Uh, about half the world's mass uh, and about 1.9 billion people are uh, currently w living underneath a nuclear weapons free zone. In the Arctic, the first proposal for this was back in 64. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the Inuit uh, Circumpolar Council, they have been uh, supportive of nuclear weapons free zones in the Arctic since 1974. Even the Russians came out, uh, uh, Gorbachev came out with the Murmansk initiative back in 87 saying, let's make the Arctic a, a nuclear weapons free zone similar to the space or the Antarctic. Or Antarctic. Um, most recent big push was in 2009 at the Copenhagen conference. There's a map and Adele will talk about this more. Here's uh, what's currently covered by nuclear weapons free zones in the world. So there's basically all the seabed, all of outer space, Antarctica, big chunks of the South Pacific, and most recently uh, areas in uh, Mongolia and Central Asia. And these are all under UN charter. Here in Alaska, actually back in the 80s, uh, the state of Alaska came out and did, this is uh, the official state of Alaska policy, it's still on the books, that uh, state of Alaska supports a nuclear freeze and reductions in nuclear warheads, which I was kind of interesting. Um, Vic Fisher, who was not able to join us today, uh, was part of the group that push this through back in 86, 87 timeframe. So what's going on now? What, you know, why is, why is, it, why is the Arctic uh, becoming a hotbed again? Um, there's a number of drivers that people need to know. Uh, one is, as you've probably heard, uh, global climate change is happening. The, the ice is melting. In the past, from a military standpoint, uh, both Russia and the US and to a lesser extent, um, the UK and Canada uh, would put nuclear powered submarines with ballistic, nuclear ballistic missiles under the ice cap. 
under the ice in the Arctic Ocean. One, it got them close to their enemies. Two, uh, underneath the ice, they were pretty much immune from detection. That's not happening anymore. Current uh, estimates are that the Arctic Ocean may be seasonally ice-free by 2030 and most likely ice, seasonally ice-free by 2050. Um, this brings up a number of things. One is the submarines can't hide in the Arctic Ocean anymore. Two, it opens up um, uh, shipping routes. Um, the, northern, the Northwest Passage is now being traversed by cruise ships. The North Sea route is seeing a resurgence across the, uh, the North uh, Shore coast of Russia. Uh, and the big, the big change here is that while uh, those, those are opening up, it, the economics of it are being seen by other countries. You, know, you, you now have China has declared itself a near Arctic nation, whatever that means, and has petitioned to become part of the Arctic Council. Um, so, and they're, they're building icebreakers and they see the economic benefits of this. There's a lot of internal politics going on. Russia is building up their military um, and economic basis along the North Sea route because that's, um, Putin sees that as a way to push Russian hegemony in the Arctic. Uh, they also see it as a major economic driver to uh, bring money into, into Russia. In the U.S., uh, you now have uh, increased interest in uh, what's referred to as Arctic domain awareness, um, where the military is increasing their um, oversight. We're starting to see a lot more uh, U.S. biplanes going into the Barents Sea and over into towards the Kara Sea. We're seeing an uptick in Russian um, maritime reconnaissance aircraft uh, coming into the Bering Sea off the coast of Alaska and being intercepted by U.S. Air Force. And as, a, as it melts, there's a lot of um, sovereignty claims. Who owns the Arctic? This is not like the Antarctic where everybody agrees it's international territory. Um, so as I said, if you look on the left, you can see the, the North Sea route and the Northwest Passage. And eventually as the ice melts out, they expect to see, uh, be able to just traverse the Arctic Ocean as you would the Atlantic or the Pacific. The, the driver between behind the North Sea route is that it cuts about 11 days transit time between Europe and China. This is what China's looking at. Um, 11 days of shipping time is billions of dollars annually. So. And sovereignty claims. The way the, the law of the sea works is you get, the country gets the first 200 miles out from the shoreline under what's called the econ exclusive economic zone. And beyond that, if you wanna claim the land or the submerged seabed, you have to show that it's part of your continental shelf. Uh, there's, Russia has been very aggressive. You may have seen in the news maybe eight, 10 years ago, they took a submarine out and they literally planted a Russian flag on a submerged ridge by the North Pole saying, this is now Russian territory. So where do we go with this? Um, a couple of things is, on the one hand, you've got the Nordic countries who have had been exposed to Chernobyl, Russian submarines sinking, um, you know, US uh, B-52s crashing into their oceans. They are all on board with, um, to, to some extent, greater or lesser, with an Arctic nuclear weapons freeze. Uh, the holdouts are Russia and the US. What's happening now, however, is that, as I said, China's 
exerting its influence into the Arctic Ocean. And China would love to see uh, a nuclear weapons free zone in the Arctic, uh, both as a way to uh, block US and Russian hegemony and as a way to increase uh, China's standing in the world. So what we've done locally here at Chapter 100, uh, we planned a youth congress uh, for last April, um, bringing in about 40 high school students from around the state and several other countries to uh, Sitka, Alaska to develop ways to uh, eliminate nuclear weapons. The uh, pandemic kind of put the kibosh on that and we went online this year. Uh, there's a website at the bottom of that slide I uh, suggest you go to there. There are links to three of the webinars that we we did um, that are available for anyone to watch. We are looking at uh, currently planning on redoing the the, the, sun, the uh, Congress next spring, uh, tentatively scheduled for April uh, again in Sitka. So last slide, what can we do? Uh, one is we will be, chapter 100 will be proposing a resolution to VFP at the next national convention to support an Arctic National Weapons Free Zone. Uh, we would ask everyone to support the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, which has, which is the enabling document to create such a zone. Uh, and basically just uh, speaking to the choir somewhat, but agitate against nuclear weapons testing and deployment and um, aim for abolition of nuclear weapons worldwide. And with that, how do I, we go into, who is next? <laughs> I'm looking at the chat here also. Okay, so next becomes Kalia and Adelia. These are two students who um, were scheduled for the uh, Youth Congress and they are, they went online and I, they will give you to the webinars and I will pass it off to them if I can figure out how to do this. Kalia, Adelia, you wanna to toggle your mics on and I'll toggle mine off. Hi everyone, my name is Callie Fielding and I am a sophomore at Skagway High School in Skagway, Alaska. Hello, I'm Adelia Deach and I'm also a sophomore at Skagway High School. We are representatives from the postponed Alaska Youth Congress for the Global Elimination of Nuclear Weapons and we're here to talk about our Point Home Instagram art installation. The Point Hope Youth Congress was a week-long event supposed to take place from April 6th to April 10th, 2020. 45 students from around the world plan to participate in workshops and lectures from nuclear activists to learn about the history and effects that nuclear weapons have had on our world. The three main workshops, photography, storytelling, and social media, taught by Pascal Marcos, digital mobilization and civic organizing, taught by Colleen Moore, and social change through nonfiction filmmaking, taught by Taylor Dunn, were designed to educate and empower students in the world of nuclear disarmament. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, the conference has been postponed to April of 2021. This spring, we had the opportunity to engage with students around the world through a series of webinars held by the organizers of this project. We got to hear from many guest speakers, including Dan O'Neill, author of The Firecracker Boys, who is also a nuclear historian and activist, Emmanuel Jal, a peace activist and incredible musician, Pascal Marcos, an activist and photographer, and Lily Odekirk, a theater artist with big plans in the world of nuclear disarmament. After a webinar with Lily Odekirk, she proposed a new Instagram project, which we've titled Point Home, and have been working on for the past month. 
Point Home is an art installation project led by international youth with the goal of using art and social media to spread awareness of nuclear disarmament. We've been exploring different themes that relate to nuclear disarmament. Our themes so far have been home, the history of nuclear weapons, and nuclear, leg nuclear legacy. If you're interested in our Point Home account, we will drop the link in the chat. So we're going to give a short tour of our Instagram account. So we'll be sharing the screen and going through a couple of our posts and what we've done so far. Sorry, two seconds, my screen sharing was disabled. Should be good now. So this is the Point Home Instagram project. Here students from around the world have curated art, interviews, photography, and more to help bring awareness to nuclear testing and technology. The project began back in April and May, and since then we've moved through our first three topics, which are home, history, and nuclear legacy. Here is our first week, and we focused on home. Each of us created an art piece that expressed what home means to us with, um, captions, uh, stories from our homes. In the captions of each post, we wrote a memory or a journal type writing piece based off the prompt, it was a time when. As the project progressed, we began creating art and presentations to accompany the research we were doing during the second and third weeks. In our second week, we talked about the creation and history of nuclear weapons and posted infographics showing some of the information we had learned. So here are a couple of our presentations we've created over the last couple of weeks. Most of these are about figures in nuclear history and we moved on to talk about figures that are often looked over in nuclear history in our second presentation there. Uh, and the third week is legacy. So through legacy, we began to talk about how nuclear testing still affects us today, um, how it's changed our world and we hope to finish off the project with an art piece accompanying an interview with Haruki Yamaguchi from the Hiroshima Peace Culture Village. She is a third and fourth generation bomb survivor and we were lucky to get a chance to interview her. We, um, throughout the project, we want to maintain our theme of home and keep everything as personal as possible. We appreciate and encourage your support on our page, so feel free to check it out on your own. The username is in the chat right now. If you want to check it out, it is at point.home.2020. Again, we would just like to thank everyone for their constant support of the Congress. Um, even through the pandemic, it has made it difficult. Um, even though we've been unable to meet in person, the spirit of the students and the collaborators, collaborators is incredible. We hope to see everyone in person next year. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. Our next presenter will be Adele Buckley with uh, Canadian Pugwash, and she'll give us, uh, she's much more knowledgeable about nuclear weapons free zones than I am, and she can ex explain how those work. <laughs> Adele? Um, yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> I think it's okay now. <clears throat> uh, you can see me and uh, uh, my first thing will be to share the screen. 
host disabled. Oh, okay. I need the host to enable screen sharing. Ah, here we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, here, here, here it is. Um, uh, <clears throat> you are screen sharing. Okay, that's fine. Well, I, um, I can't see my whole screen just now. I can only see me. But <clears throat> I hope you can see the entire PowerPoint. Uh, uh, and I, I really do appreciate what Craig Wilson had to say because it, it, it's so... Um, much knowledge displayed there, and, and I, uh, I really appreciate what he, he has given us as, as <clears throat> the reason for wanting the Arctic to be nuclear weapon free. So I am going to assume not that we, we do not need convincing, uh, however, and we also need to know that um, global security is actually diminished by uh, keeping nuclear weapons in the Arctic. Of course, we know there are no um, weapons there. Uh, uh, there are no targets in the Arctic, uh, at, at least at present, and, and submarines uh, can hide there, uh, less so, no ice, uh, and, and uh, deliver uh, devastating consequences to many parts of the world. So we uh, we wish to uh, um, not to not continue that. Um, so uh, we want to sustain peace and cooperation in the Arctic because that's where we are now. Um, the The surface of the ocean is demilitarized. Many parts of the Arctic are most of the Arctic is demilitarized uh, above the Arctic Circle. There certainly are um, uh, military bases in various places, but um, demilitarized from, our, from uh, the situation we're interested in. We need to adapt the en environment in so many ways. <clears throat> Human security is really at risk in, in uh, so many different uh, aspects of it, uh, particularly food and uh, permafrost uh, uh, collapsing, uh, then we, we need and we have cooperative governance in various ways because it's necessary. Uh, there's resources there. Everybody wants to benefit from, by exploiting them. We need off limits. And so we need to begin now uh, to get the Arctic policy of uh, to be nuclear weapon free and starting with the uh, nu nuclear weapons free states. And this is, this is really important um, because what happens if you have an, a nuclear weapon free zone in the Arctic? Uh, you, will, you will have uh, uh, really uh, a test place where all sorts of things under a treaty because this is a, a, a legal treaty under the UN when you get there, uh, that, that can be tested ahead of time to see how they work, like verification and, and many other aspects of nuclear weapon free zone, so as to uh, be confidence building to the rest of the world that if we would get rid of nuclear weapons, these, these methods have been tested and so on. So it, that'd be really useful. Now, uh, uh, I've got a little thing on my screen that says you are screen sharing. I hope you don't see that. But uh, uh, we, we've got uh, in the Arctic nations, remember the map, look from above uh, uh, at the North Pole, we've got the non-nuclear weapon states, Canada, Denmark, Iceland, Norway. Uh, unfortunately, these are members of NATO, meaning they're nuclear weapon dependent, but at least they're nuclear weapon free. And then there's Sweden and Finland, which also don't have uh, any uh, territory on the ocean, but they are uh, Arctic states. And then there's the nuclear weapon states, and we know who they are uh, all too well. So um, the UN has set 
principles. They, they did this in 1975, uh, <clears throat> and you've heard about them. Um, excuse me, I'll try to not be so scratchy. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, here's the, well, an important thing, uh, because you must uh, have the regions in the state in, in the region that wants to be a nuclear weapon free zone, they have to arrive freely at the decision that they want to do it. So that's important. And you can imagine that how, how it might be sort of difficult to put it mildly to get the uh, Russia and the US. Now we're just talking about some parts of the Arctic. We're not talking about the entire countries of those two two states. Nevertheless, this is extremely difficult. Uh, and, and if you get one, it has to be verifiable and limited duration. And in the end, nuclear weapon states have to ratify protocols in their own parliaments to recognize the treaty and offer what is called negative security assurances. So um, you've seen this. Um, that's the thing. Uh, the, there's several dates uh, that I, I've put here, and you can see a lot more about this on the UN if you wish to. There's also related things like the seabed treaties, Svalbard, and the Outer Space Treaty, which also support and are nuclear weapon free. Then let's have a look at what Craig showed you already. This is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, the nautical boundary, which is for sure absolutely the territory of the country, 12 miles out. Then there's the, the exclusive economic zone, 200 miles out. And if you can prove certain undersea things, and there, there is work going on at the UN, you may have other claims. But um, have a look, and you see US, um, Russia, um, sort of huge participants. But this other group is interesting, because here we have Iceland. We have um, Norway, we have Greenland, and we have Canada. They're all not nuclear weapon states, and they all could, in their own territory, uh, have a nuclear weapon free zone uh, if they approached the UN and did all the things that are required. So, um, the circumpolar states that are already free of nuclear weapons. Uh, are in an ideal position to, um, one, they could start by having an, a statement in their Arctic security policy that they, they favor a nuclear weapon free zone in the Arctic. Um, Denmark has one, nobody else does, and it would be an excellent start and a, an achievement in the right direction. And they could host the circumpolar non-nuclear weapon states to begin discussions if they, uh, that would be a very good and peaceful move. Um, so this, these are, if the goal is an Arctic nuclear weapon free zone, then um, the non-nuclear weapon states meet and begin no negotiations. Then they agree on a plan for an Arctic nuclear weapon free zone on their territory. And then they approach the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs to say, we want to do this. And then the UN helps them in many different ways, but they can't have much help from the UN until they approach as, as a group and say, we want to do it. Um, and um, another way of gathering, which is usual support, uh, you, you go to the UN First Committee. Uh, which meets uh, every uh, every time the non-proliferation treaty groups meet. Uh, at, well, sorry, it, it meets every fall, um, every year. Uh, not not the non-proliferation treaty. Anyway, you go there. You 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 the diplomats and others speak to their colleagues to try to get support because now a vote will be coming up. Uh, you go to the UN General Assembly. Uh, the non-nuclear weapon states introduce a resolution for an Arctic nuclear weapon free zone in their region. And, and then, uh, then there's a vote. So with this, uh, we would love to see this. Um, all of the present nuclear weapon uh, free zones have taken 
rather a long time, I mean, 10 or 20 years. Really, that's unfortunately the case. It would be nice if we could accelerate it, but this is, uh, this is a long-winded thing. Uh, however, uh, the faster that we start, the faster, the faster that the nations start, that, that governments that can start do start, that's important. So, um, so after we had a nuclear weapon-free zone, well, now we've got part of the Arctic covered, but what, what would we do then? Well, that group of states needs to approach the US and Russia proposing the Arctic nuclear weapon-free zone. Of course, they're not very likely to be thrilled to do that, uh, but in fact, um, what happens here is, is that, uh, sorry, my phone is ringing, but it will stop in a minute or two. Um, there's a, there would be a, a regional and global pressure all around. In fact, there's the treaty for the uh, prohibition of nuclear weapons, which you have probably heard of, which is in play at the moment. And, and so all of that is global pressure, like do something. And we're not talking about the entire US and Russia territory, we're talking about just the Arctic territory. So you begin maybe with eliminating certain kinds of submarines that have nuclear weapons on them. And in time, uh, you know, um, with optimism, they join. And then um, there, this genuinely could be a tipping point because, because as I said, it, it's a place where you can exercise um, some of the aspects that you'd like to try out before you really become nuclear weapon free in the entire world. I just give you this map because there, there certainly is discussion as to what <laughs> what territory would we do. Well, there's the Arctic Circle. Uh, we could do um, just uh, places that are, um, you know, just off, off the coast. Um, we could do um, the uh, uh, search and rescue agreement boundaries, which are all w extremely well defined uh, right now. And that would be, you know, a sort of speed up because you don't have to define new boundaries. It's, they're already defined. So, um, so who wants it? Well, uh, the UN wants it, when stands ready to help. Civil society wants it. As you know, that's who we all are. Uh, the Inuit Circumpolar Council wants it. The population of the Arctic has been surveyed. They want it. Uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross is very strong on this. And the occasional government, uh, not Canada, not US, but wants it. So um, UN, um, in fact, uh, we, if we wanted some help from the UN, there is one thing that could be done is commission an in-depth review of Arctic nuclear weapon free zone issues potential for, uh, there are a lot of studies done by the UN, ma sort of massive, uh, important uh, technical and <coughs> learned work, uh, which, uh, which, which is, would be very useful in this regard. Um, we've got the uh, NPT Treaty Article 7. We've got um, every time there's a review conference, and there was to be one, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> um, but in, for, unfortunately, of course, COVID-19 fixed that, but there will probably be one uh, in 2021 uh, NPT Review Conference, and at that time, the treaties, uh, the, every nation that has already a nuclear weapon free zone and has established it, they meet and, and uh, they don't, they're not exclusive in their meeting. So you could deal with that. Um, one thing that you can't do, uh, un unless there's, there's some in backdoor way in, you cannot go to the diplomats conferences. All you can really do is make a, uh, a civil society seminar uh, widely advertised. This is done all the time. There are many of them at the review conferences and, and uh, hope that you get the diplomats to attend. So that's, that's, you cannot attend the sessions of the UN uh, review people. Uh, you can look at them from a, a balcony and listen. That's all you can do. 
So uh, that's important to know. And of course, Pugwash Conferences supports them. Um, and then uh, this is a quote from a conference in Astana, Kazakhstan, the retiring Under Secretary General for Disarmament and, and uh, past president of uh, now. So um, let's see, what if? Well, if we don't do it, we get another theater of operations for militaries of the world and we don't get preservation of the Arctic Ocean surface military, not militarized, no, we don't. And the Arctic Council observers who are all nuclear weapon states, you see their names here, they send, uh, not only do the US and Russia do it, but China, Britain, France, India, they all send submarines to the Arctic. Uh, you get more, uh, you get circumpolar nations who are NATO members, consider exercises in and near the Arctic. And uh, of course you have environmental consequences. So um, I think uh, I, I would uh, certainly encourage you to go to um, the uh, Can Canadian Pugwash uh, uh, sponsored discussion group. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. Sometimes there's discussion, sometimes people just share papers. Um, and, and you can, uh, if you go to this uh, Arctic, nwfz.ca, uh, you will find a link to get you to look at this and join it if you wish. So that's it for my screen sharing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adele. And our, our next presenter is uh, Chigan. Pleasant, a uh, college student here at UAS, and she is from Bethel, Alaska, and she will talk about uh, Project Chariot. Shigun, are you available? There we go. Uh Luktuk, Wangi Tiga Jiugan, Mom Tiggi Zagami Urunga, Anga Yuna Ratka, or Inupia Runga, Suli, Yupioka. Angayunagatka, Dimkalu, Kaizalu, Akama, Ilagait, Kogilingamio Root, Angama, Ilagait, Sitnswakamio Root, Koyanak, Veterans for Peace, Aigayu Lakma. Hi, good morning. My name is Jugan. Um, I am from what is traditionally known as Momtagizluk or Bethel, Alaska. I am Inupiaq and Yupik. My parents are Martha and Julius Pleasant. My mom's family is from Kwigalingok and my dad's family is from what is traditionally known as Sutnsawak or Nome. And thank you Veterans for Peace for inviting me here um, to talk about uh, Project Chariot and uh, radioactive iodine testin, testing on uh, the Inupiaq and Athabascan people. Um, and so the Air Force established uh, the Arctic Aeromedic, oh, and I also don't have like uh, a slide prepared to talk about this, but maybe I should if we're gonna keep having these discussions. Um, but the Air Force established an Arctic Aeromedical Laboratory uh, in 1951 to study the effects of cold climate uh, on the Nubiak people, even though they like had these tests um, done and studied and their findings were inconclusive, but I think they just wanted ways to further dehumanize uh, the indigenous peoples that were already occupying the land um, in the northern climates. Um, so they were conducting these studies and they needed to find participants that could resist the Arctic and subarctic climates and how they like were able to do this or how they were able to find this um, like suitable was that the people that they were doing these tests on did not live in the Arctic and um, the, they were trying to figure out what was going on in the Cold War and they were getting pressure from that and the threat of nuclear bombs and confrontations from the Soviet Union um, because of the close proximity Alaska has with uh, Russia. Um, so the military 
base grew alongside the fleet of uh, range bombers and fighter squadrons and early uh, warning radar stations. And one of AAL's research projects between 1956 and 1957 was uh, to investigate the role of the thyroid in cold climate acclimatization. And what they did was that they went to four villages, um, um, Anichivik Pass, Fort Yukon, Arctic Village, and Point Hope. Uh, they talked to the elders from the village and they like sort of like confided in them that this was going to be something that was good for everybody and um, you know we tend to trust our elders and native communities because they're the ones that have most all of the wisdom and uh, knowledge that we need in order to sustain ourselves and pass on our culture um, but they went on the radio and they found 102 Alaska Native participants, the Athabascans and the Nubiak, and they only gathered 19 of their white personnel uh, to be part of this study. And they exposed them to harmful amounts of uh, radioactive iodine um, that like, I think it got passed down into like their genes somehow. And I, I think only 63 of them are alive now, but most of them d died due to complications uh, because of that. And uh, I know that Craig, that Craig touched on a little bit of Project Chariot, but Project Chariot um, was proposed 30 miles out of Tigiagak or Point Hope. And that is what they were doing was to build a port and that doesn't, to build, to build a port to expand the economic prosperity of uh, US and um, the sort of lack of economy that we have up north because we don't have a lot of resources that we can really just ship out anywhere that easily. Um, so they were going to build an artificial port um, and it was 160 times Large, the proposal was 160 times larger than the Hiroshima bomb. And what they were going to do was they were going to, in the time of the detonations, they were just going to relocate the villagers of Tigiagak, the Anubiak people, um, for a year. And as they were testing and um, like gathering results from some of the things, the caribou and the villagers um, all across the circumpolar region were showing um, a heightened increase of radioactive levels of um, like nuclear fallout. And the it was because the lichen captured the fallout from the other detonations that were happening around the world because uh, I don't remember exactly how it was put, but maybe Adele, Adele seems like an expert, um, that the fallout like gets into the atmosphere and then it hits, um, it goes to the top, the top of where it is, it like falls up into the atmosphere. Um, and it was hitting a lot of the circumpolar regions. And um, if they were proposing five nuclear bombs that were buried in the ground, and they were like, from, from Nevada, as um, Craig mentioned earlier, like, what were they expecting? What were they expecting the long term effects to be? for the Nubiak people of Tigiagak, which is like the oldest inhabited settlement like in the world. I don't know if, yeah, in the world, like they've lived there for more like recorded, there's recorded evidence of them living there longer than 10,000 years. And that's like blatant racism and uh, like a, a constant dehumanization that is happening to the First Nations and uh, Indigenous people around the world. And so Project Chariot, like it was proposed by President Eisenhower in 1950, or, and, and Ed, Edward Teller from 1956 to 1958, but um, it was put at a halt in 1962 because in 1960, um, Howard Rock and a bunch of other um, people from Tigiagak, they found out about the tests and what it was doing to the people and uh, the harmful effects of radi uh, radiation and nuclear fallout being exposed to them. And they banded together 
and sh showed strong opposition for the proposal of the port. Um, and Howard, Howard Rock owned one of the oldest newspapers um, that I don't think is longer in circulation, but it's a tender times. And uh, he was able to gather support from all around Alaska and 13 members of the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. Um, well, Inkska didn't happen until 1907, but everybody, it was like all the Athabascans, Clinkett, Haida, Yupik, uh, Inupiaq, um, like Aleut, Sukriak, they, like they all gathered together and they formed AFN so that they can be involved in these dialogues and what is happening on state and federal policies, just so that we would have a stronger voice and we would be like closer together and have a, a stronger impact on things that are like legislation that is trying to get passed that is not in favor for the First Nations and Indigenous peoples. Um, yeah, but it stopped in 1962 after those meetings of the village of Tigiaka meeting. That start, it started in like 1960. Uh, with the Atomic Energy Commission. And then it didn't happen, but I think they're still seeing dangerous effects from those bombs that are hidden. Like it might've been cleaned up, but like they don't know where it could have leaked really. Cause there's five, there's like four. Yeah, I think there's five, five of those test sites dug up like everywhere. And it's, it's probably still in the land. Like you can't, I don't know. I don't know, but thank you. That's it, Kayanak. All right, thank you very much, Shigan. Our last speaker is Dr. Daly Sambo. Um, she is the International Chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council former associate professor at uh, University of Alaska. And she will be talking about um, the ICC's push for uh, Arctic nuclear weapons free zone and some current nuclear issues. Um, Dr. Daly, Dr. Sambo. Fiona, can everyone hear and see? Yeah, no, it, it looks like Garrett is um, going to pull up the, the video. I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Give me, give me a moment and I'll okay. try to locate it. Is it emailed to me? I'll grab it. Can someone will cue me up for a start here? Yeah, I apologize. I might have to look for it. Is it something that you sent to Sam? No. I'll keep looking for it. I don't know. I don't know where it is. Does someone want to send me a different link?
Uh, Daily, are you having trouble sharing your screen? Is that the issue? Uh, no, I can see. I can. I can see everything. Um, I can share my screen. Uh, I can see the other uh, speakers uh, and their. And their boxes, am I up now? You are sharing your screen. I see a PowerPoint that says security of Inuit in our homelands, coastal seas. Okay. Are we good to go then? I think you're good. Okay. First of all, uh, allow me to thank the um, Veterans for Peace um, for the invitation, but also more importantly for your larger objectives and your mission to uh, really instill peace, especially uh, in the context of establishing nuclear free zones. And the presentation that I want to give will just uh, quickly survey some of the past work of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Thank you, uh, Craig, for uh, creating a a larger framework. I also appreciate uh, Adele and the very detailed information about how to uh, lay the groundwork uh, for something substantial and concrete in terms of uh, the creation of a nuclear free zone. But even more significantly, I'm just grateful for the presentations by Chugan, uh, by Kalia and Adalia and the youth because Something that Adele said about the lengthy period of time for some of these things to take root, uh, we need the next generation to carry forward uh, the work and the objective and to carry on uh, the mission. So I'll just go through this slideshow um, or this PowerPoint very quickly and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for discussion thereafter. As Craig and others have illustrated, uh, the Arctic is a unique and distinct region of the world, but it's an integral part of the entire globe in terms of atmosphere, in terms of ocean currents. Uh, but for us as the Inuit, the traditional peoples, the original peoples of the circumpolar region, it's our homeland. And I appreciate this map because it was created by one of our or own organizations in Canada, the Makovic, um, the Makovic Corporation. And it illustrates the uh, traditional homelands of Inuit from the Russian Far East in Chikotka, that yellow uh, area there, all throughout Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. So we occupy in terms of our traditional homelands and coastal seas, we occupy over 40% of the Arctic region. These, as, as Chugan has said, are um, our, our homelands, our coastal seas, and we have an intimate and profound relationship with this region, with this territory. And uh, again, the role that, um, uh, we should be playing in terms of the direct impacts uh, on the Arctic region. Uh, it's, it's essential, as, as Chugan was uh, illustrating in the context of some of these past exper experiments and, and other um, uh, initiatives that we should be playing a role, and indeed we have played a role in the past. Uh, just for a bit of historical context, the Inuit Circumpolar Council was originally and formally organized in 1977, June of 1977. Mm -hmm. Eben Hobson, who was then the mayor of the North Slope Borough, had the foresight, the extraordinary foresight, to bring the Inuit together from across uh, the national borders between the Russian Federation, the United States, Canada, and Greenland to bring us together as a people to unify the Inuit throughout the circumpolar region. So this is a photo of our first gathering at Utkiavik in June of 1977. When welcoming the delegates to the first organizing conference of the ICC, 
Evan Hobson said some very, very important things. Our language contains the memory of 4,000 years of human survival through the conservation and good managing of our Arctic wealth. And these words are important. Ours is the language of the very environment that challenges the environmental safety of existing offshore technology. At the moment, at that time, uh, there were all kinds of plans and preparations to look at offshore oil and gas uh, development. So he was he was speaking very uh, specifically about uh, uh, specific initiatives, but I want to emphasize his words about environmental safety. And the final paragraph: Our language contains the intricate knowledge of the ice that we have seen no others demonstrate. Without our central involvement, there can be no safe and responsible Arctic resource development. Here again, the context was uh, potential for offshore oil and gas development, but these are really profound words in terms of our language and the intricate knowledge, the indigenous knowledge that Inuit have demonstrated in terms of their adaptation to this unique and harsh environment. Which as Adele even uh, invoked the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, Article 234, and the importance of sea ice, and that the, the contribution and the power of indigenous knowledge and what Hobson was saying at that time is highly significant and remains significant to this day. He also indicated, and this was a, this was a, a message to the former Soviet Union, uh, now the Russian Federation, that we in Nupiat live under four of the five flags of the Arctic coast. One of those four flags is badly missed here today. And of course, the context was the Cold War. But he went on to say that it is generally agreed that we enjoy certain Aboriginal legal rights. And we're talking about inherent rights or pre-existing rights, rights that attach to us as individual human beings, but also as collectivities. Therefore, it's important that the indigenous people of the Arctic and that our governments agree about the status of these rights if they're to be uniformly respected. Again, this was in 1977, well before uh, all kinds of um, different movements and organizations were taking place and certainly well before the efforts of, um, of academic institutions and governments across the globe focusing on the Arctic region. At the 1977 ICC conference, uh, the resolution that Craig alluded to earlier was adopted. And this is specifically concerning peaceful and safe uses of the Arctic circumpolar zone. And at the time, Inuit were acutely aware of the impacts, not only of uh, Project Chariot, as has been raised by, by Craig and Chugum, but also um, the uh, comments of Kelly and Adalia in terms of uh, the pressures that we were facing at the hands of the Department of Defense, really. Um, so we were aware of these activities, these developments, and the call for the peaceful and environmentally safe purposes and use of the Arctic had to be underscored. So in 1977, this resolution uh, was adopted. We put uh, the world community on notice to the extent that we could at that time that we had direct opposition to the um, establishment of military bases, carrying out of military activities and testing, uh, disposition of any kind of waste, and also that the existing waste be removed from the Arctic area. And Chugan spoke a bit about uh, some of that. Certainly the North Slope Borough carried out an extensive effort to do an assessment and also begin the removal. But more importantly, to ensure that a moratorium be called on the emplacement of nuclear weapons in our homelands within Inuit Nunat, the Arctic region. 
some have spoken of uh, Arctic policy, and certainly Adele spoke to um, the issue of uh, respective nation state Arctic policy and the need to ensure that or lobby for the uh, inclusion of a reference to uh, peaceful uses of the Arctic and uh, the establishment of an Arctic nuclear free zone. The Inuit through the ICC have worked um, consistently from our first organizing in 1977 to develop a comprehensive set of principles and elements for an Arctic policy. And in that Arctic policy document, we also reference uh, the need uh, to ensure that the Arctic is environmentally safe and sound. A number of different um, activities that took place at the regional level uh, were then pursued by academics and uh, natural scientists and others. And in particular, I point to the Working Group on Arctic International Relations and their effort to try to bring not only indigenous peoples or Arctic indigenous peoples together with academics and scientists, but also governments and diplomats to have a dialogue about what does it really mean to safeguard the Arctic environment, this unique and distinct uh, region of our planet. This then triggered uh, a range of different initiatives, including uh, that of the Finnish government to put in place the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, and there's not enough time in this uh, presentation to go through this, but uh, this then led to the creation of the Arctic Council. And much of what Adele was talking about directly uh, invokes the need for us to look at what the Arctic eight nation states who are all members of the Arctic Council should and could do uh, to be responsive to our objective of a nuclear free zone in the Arctic. So the Arctic Council was established in 1996, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Several years later, after the 1977 organizing conference at another General Assembly, the ICC adopted a resolution in 1983 reiterating the call for a nuclear free zone to be established in the Arctic, but in a much more detailed fashion, identifying at, at that time and in that context, what were the, uh, the new threats in terms of militarization, security and defense issues in the Arctic. You can see in this resolution that there was specific mention of the cruise missile testing, also the placement of the MX missile in uh, Alaska, but ultimately and uh, significantly, the urging again of uh, the United Nations in this case, um, adopting a policy for a nuclear free zone in the Arctic. Craig's already mentioned uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and his famous 1987 Murmansk speech. Uh, an important footnote to this speech is the fact that Inuit leadership uh, were invited to the 70th uh, Soviet celebration uh, with leadership and um, it was, it, it's not a well-known fact that individuals like Akaluk Lungi, who was at that time uh, the vice chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council had an opportunity to attend this celebration and also have the ear of Gorbachev and some of his other leaders. And uh, we were quite surprised at the references made in this famous Murmansk speech. And I think that it's, it's useful to read the entire speech um, that, that Gorbachev delivered, but again, highly significant that he spoke about the tension uh, that um, the, the U.S. in particular and their notion of an Arctic strategy, their orientation, and the, and the potential political slash military conflict that could unfold um, 
uh, were important points that he made, but significantly, as, as Craig has noted, let the north of the globe, the Arctic, become a zone of peace. This is quite significant and uh, something that um, needs to be understood in the context of the potential diplomatic influence of, of Inuit at the international level and our own diplomats uh, having an opportunity to influence the, um, the global affairs of the day. Um, so again, in 1996, the Arctic Council was uh, created and many refer to the Arctic Council as a soft law uh, intergovernmental organization. And indeed uh, it is, but they've spawned some important legally binding instruments um, such as uh, protection of the environment in the relation to oil and gas development, um, the opportunity for uh, increased cooperation in terms of Arctic research, uh, also a search and rescue uh, agreement uh, that was signed by them. So I'm suggesting that amongst the Arctic eight states that are listed here, there is an, a, a precedent for legally binding uh, agreements to emerge um, or be um, uh, percolated within the Arctic Council as a soft law intergovernmental organization, but emerge into a hard law legally binding agreements. Um, but I also point out that, of course, as has already been stated, that the, that the United States and the Russian Federation are the, the nuclear weapons holders that we have we, we have uh, alliances and allegiances that have to be recognized in terms of the current geopolitical uh, climate and significantly now within the Arctic Council and a bit problematic for Inuit as one of the, importantly, one of the permanent participants of the Arctic Council, this growing list of observer states and I think it's important to point out the People's Republic of China. Uh, that's significant. We, we know who the five permanent members of the Security Council happen to be. We know about the growing tensions uh, geopolitically uh, in the world. We cannot uh, stop and ignore the comments by Secretary of State uh, Pompeo and others. We just have to be mindful of uh, these chess pieces moving uh, across the Arctic region and the significance of them. Uh, but I think that it's important to also say that uh, we should be mindful of the fact that the Arctic Council at present does not allow for discussion of military defense and security issues. And from my point of view, this is a shortfall of the organization itself um, and something that has to be uh, overcome because if we are going to talk about environmental security, uh, peace and security, we have to recognize that everything is interrelated. So how is it that the Arctic Council can guarantee environmental safety and security without talking about uh, peace and security in the defense context? I want to quickly say that the the, the fact that the UN General Assembly adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, September 13, 2007, is huge. And it is important to Inuit as well as other Arctic Indigenous Peoples that the United Nations itself, and when I say the United Nations, we have to remember that we're talking about member states. Member states have made legal commitments and obligations to uplift indigenous peoples and to recognize uh, the human rights norms that attach to us specifically as indigenous peoples. So affirming our right to self-determination, affirming our rights to lands, territories, and resources, affirming the uh, matter of consent, affirming our right to participate in decision making, also protection from the destruction of our culture, and significantly, the right to our own cultural integrity and security, including food security. So keep the UN Declaration uh, in mind, and, and Chugan uh, alluded to this earlier in terms of um, 
our pre-existing or inherent rights. Others have already mentioned the impacts of climate change. Um, if you are anywhere near the Arctic, the Arctic Ocean, the coastal seas, or terra firma, the uh, Arctic region, you can see and feel the impacts, even if you spend a short amount of time there. And I point these matters out because not only are we talking about the, the issues and challenges that we face in terms of creation of an Arctic nuclear free zone, but they're compounded by all of these other impacts. In addition, others have already spoken about the impacts of Arctic shipping. Well, of course, this also means, as I underscore in this slide, increased militarization because of the loss of the sea ice, uh, the ability for increased vessel traffic, as well as the subsurface activity that at present, you know, the, the, the Coast Guard's monitoring what happens at, on the surface. What about what's going on subsurface and the, the submarine uh, traffic and activity, not to mention the past uh, accidents that have occurred uh, throughout the Arctic region and in particular, uh, for example, the Thule Air Base in uh, the Inukhuit uh, homelands of our relations um, in Hanap or Northern Greenland. So in 19, um, uh, 1983 was the last resolution we adopted. Significantly in the adoption of the Ukiavik Declaration at the uh, General Assembly in 2018, the ICC adopted another um, call for laying the foundation for diplomatic talks to establish a nuclear free zone. And this is largely because of the continuing activity within the region in terms of military installations, uh, the, the activities, uh, more recent activities of um, the Russian Federation, which was addressed um, in terms of the, the sovereignty claims that uh, remain ongoing. But uh, the Ukiavik Declaration specifically, uh, under the broad theme, Inuit, the Arctic we want, uh, included a mandate to the ICC to initiate diplomatic talks for the purpose of laying the groundwork for negotiations to declare the Arctic as a peaceful zone. So we've not given up on uh, this objective as an intergovernmental organ excuse me, as a non-governmental organization of Arctic indigenous peoples. And the um, steps that Adele identified in her very detailed PowerPoint presentation are quite significant to how one might lay the groundwork for negotiations, not only in the UN context, but in potentially in the Arctic Council context. So all of this, um, uh, is interrelated, interdependent, and indivisible with our sense and our perspective of security. Our food security, if we don't have a healthy environment, what kinds of impacts will we be seeing in terms of our food security? We're presently facing food insecurity. Our cultural security in terms of who we are as human beings that have adapted to this unique region, of course, environmental security is at risk. Our own economic security, whether it's our traditional economies of reliance upon our lands and coastal seas, or if it's economic security in terms of uh, jobs and positions where we can support our families and be active in objectives like creating a nuclear free zone. So all of this is to say that we are talking about the importance of those who inhabit the Arctic region to gain their security, to gain Inuit security. So Kuyana, I appreciate the opportunity to share these remarks. I went over huge chunks of history, but um, hope that uh, this has been useful. All right, thank you very much, Doctor. There is one question for you, um, and it's from Heather. Does uh, Greenland's representation on the Arctic Security Council still go through Denmark? 
Yes, actually, um, the, the matters of defense, security, and military issues still was, is within the Danish realm. Um, that uh, authority has not been um, uh, devolved to uh, Greenland government. However, uh, it is important to recognize that any actions that are taken, of course, the Greenland government has to be consulted. Um, one perfect example of that is that when the U.S. government went to renegotiate the lease on the land where the Thule Air Base exists, the Greenland government had to play a direct and meaningful role in that renegotiation. So that's an example of how they continue to play an important um, and an influential role, but uh, not a not a unilateral role in terms of defense and security issues. All right, thank you. Thank you to all our panelists for presentations and thank you for everyone who, all the attendees are listening in. Um, and we're now, we did very well. We had until 10.30 and I read 10.29. <laughs> <laughs> Success. Uh, at this point I will turn, unless there are any other questions, I will turn this back over to Garrett. Thanks everyone, you did a terrific job, appreciate it. Uh, I learned a lot, I know that. Hopefully uh, folks who were able to see it, um, let, let other people know that are attending the conference that it'll be up until the end of August. Um, it might take a, a couple of hours to, to get the video up, uh, saved in the watch link, but um, it'll be available and hopefully we could release this uh, soon also on our social media, so. Thank you, panelists. It was, uh, it was fantastic. And uh, we'll see you at the next event. Goodbye. Thank you.